and trying to make sense of this broad regional pattern of variation that we see within Homo erectus, it's important to think about how these features came to exist. So we have the development of distinctive regional characteristics, ones that seem to unite earlier and later Southeast Asian specimens, for example, or earlier and later African specimens, or earlier and later European specimens. But we also have trends that are common throughout. For example, one of the most obvious trends that we have is an increase in cranial capacity, continually expanding brain size associated with later lower middle Pleistocene and middle Pleistocene specimens. So for example, here if we look at a map of cranial capacity across time, we can see that from that time period of about 1.2 million years of age up until about 200,000 years of age, there's a distinctive increase in cranial capacity. There's a lot of variation at any given time period, but there's a dramatic increase as we go from earlier to later specimens in terms of the cranial capacity. Going from things like Dimenisi, for example, around 600 to 700 cc's, Nericotome, about 800 cc's, the specimens like Cobway, which are closer to 1200 or 1300 cc's, getting into the modern range, in other words. The other trends that we see are different regional variation in terms of the overall features. And we can think about how could this develop, and what is the appropriate interpretation of this variation? Is this associated with distinct species differences, where, for example, we have Homo erectus evolving in East Asia, maybe Homo heidelbergensis evolving in Africa and Europe, or perhaps even Homo antecessor occurring in Europe, if we think of the Adipuerca materials, which have been described as a different species altogether? Or are these different regional populations of one expansive lineage? So if we think about it, let's look at a map for a second. And again, Homo erectus emerges sometime in East Africa, or at least in Africa, around 2 million years of age, maybe a little bit later than that. Very quickly, we begin to see evidence of expansion of this lineage, as one of the characteristics of Homo erectus, one of the characteristics of Homo in general, is that they expand into new environments. So we find them at Dimenisi at 1.8 million years of age. Very quickly thereafter, we find evidence in Southeast Asia, evidence in East Asia, and eventually evidence in Southern Europe. So we see this expansion into different geographic regions. So as we think about these different geographic populations, we again have, say, an East African, maybe a little bit of a Southern African, maybe a little bit of a North African population within Africa. We have maybe this population that exists kind of in the middle, the intersection of these areas. We have a Southern European population. We have an East Asian population. We have a Southeast Asian population. And who knows, maybe we'll eventually recover more material from Central Asia and have a Central Asian or South Asian population. And we have these different geographic regions, and we can say, is gene flow connecting these regions? In other words, is there the exchange of genes maintaining species continuity between these different adjacent regions? There doesn't have to be much, but if there's just enough so that there's no complete geographic isolation, no complete reproductive isolation, then we might be talking about a polytypic lineage, one that has different geographic variants associated with different geographic populations, but that still fundamentally is the same lineage. This would explain, for example, why we see a similar pattern of increasing uh, cranial vault thickness, increasing superorbital torus size, increasing overall cranial size across all these different regions, regardless of actually what region we're looking at. So for example, the fact that we have increasing cranial capacity in all of these specimens could be understood as imagining a gene associated with increased cranial capacity emerging in Africa. Because it's under selection as advantageous, again, we think increased brain size is something that was highly selected for in the Pleistocene, we can imagine it spreading via gene flow to other populations and becoming established within these other populations. So that as long as there's sufficient gene flow, we might see that trait spread throughout the entire erectus lineage. And yet traits that aren't under strong selection might not have the capacity to move between different geographic regions. They might sort of persist within a geographic area, but never have the sort of oomph or the push from natural selection to move from East Asia to Central Asia, onto Europe, onto Africa, for example. So one thing might be this directionality of selection. Traits which are under universal selection, which are universally advantageous, might spread throughout the entire lineage. Traits that are more regionally advantageous, or maybe reflect things like associative mating or sexual selection within regions, might remain confined to different geographic regions, helping to establish these different geographic distinctive characteristics of different geographic populations. The other factor that comes into play is this issue of population size. There are more people in Africa, more populations, more area that hominins can occupy than in the rest of the world. So we'd expect larger populations, perhaps supporting more variability in Africa than anywhere else. Additionally, Africa is the source of these populations. Homo erectus originates in East Africa, so we would expect to again find more retained variability within East Africa. 
Every time you get dispersal of humans outside of Africa, you're essentially sampling a subsample of the overall picture of variation that we have in Africa. As you move from, for example, Dimenisi onto Southeast Asia, you're sampling again a subsample of this variability. So you might expect to see a pattern of reducing variability as you move away from the center of this evolutionary pattern. So along the edges, we might expect to find more homogeneity, more characteristic similarities between specimens than we find in the center. Additionally, as you move into smaller, more geographically isolated populations, you might expect genetic drift to operate more strongly. Recall that genetic drift reduces overall variability. So again, we might expect to see a pattern of overall similarities in terms of some significant trends, such as increasing brain size, increasing cranial vault thickness, coupled with distinctive regional variability, particularly in the peripheral regions, Europe, East Asia, Southeast Asia, coupled with also reduced variability in some of these most extreme peripheral regions, far Western Europe, Southeast Asia, we might expect to be overall more similar to each other, the specimens that we find, than we find in Africa. So we'd always expect to find more variability in Africa, broad trends that extend across regions, more narrow, specifically defined geographic distinctive features that exist within different regions. This is one way of encapsulating and understanding these patterns of variation that we see in the middle Pleistocene. We'll talk more about these next week as we move into the later Pleistocene and begin to see how modernity emerges out of this complex geographic and temporal landscape of variability.